Hi friends, thank you for taking time out of your day to spend a little with me. I appreciate you. We have a case involving circus history today, and it's a case I didn't know about, so I ask you all to join me as we remember Paul Jung. Paul Jung was born on March 18, 1900 in Dayton, Ohio, to parents Carl and Mary Jung, who were already in show business by the time of his birth. Paul followed in their footsteps, debuting an acrobatic and dance routine with his brother Walter in the vaudeville circuit when he was eight years old. By 17, his career took a shift. In 1917, Paul found work as an acrobatic clown with the Ringling Brothers Circus and continued to travel with the show when it combined with Barnum & Bailey the following year. Paul continued his tenure with the circus until around 1924 when he decided to return back to vaudeville for several years before realizing his heart belonged to the circus. He returned to Ringling permanently in 1934. According to records, Paul's occupation in 1918 was listed as clown with the circus, but it is claimed he did not become a performing clown until 1935. Paul was under the guidance of some of the best mentors in the business, Lou Jacobs and Felix Adler, whose faces were already the icons of American clowning, and he quickly gained notoriety. Paul was imaginative and knew how to entertain an audience. He created props and accessories which were used by the circus, and even produced many of the iconic clown gags seen at the circus even today. These acts included Fireman Save My Baby, which was popularized in 1941 in Walt Disney's animated film Dumbo, The Atom Smasher, in which a giant clown is placed in a machine and crushed, then on the other side, six smaller clowns wearing identical outfits emerge. Another was the oversized cannon, where a smaller clown is placed into a very large cannon and shot across the circus before slowly floating from the top of the tent unharmed. Paul was the brain behind these and many more which earned him the title of producing clown for Ringling, which was a position he held for more than 25 years. He started to spend more time backstage than in the ring, where he supervised the clowns or helped prep them for using the larger props when needed. During the early 1940s, Paul worked closely with Ringling's Hagenbeck Wallace Circus when he met a young woman named Elsie. Originally from Chicago, where she danced professionally, Elsie answered an ad for the circus. She found herself performing a dancing routine for the Hagenbeck Wallace Circus, and she liked it. She played every role imaginable from trapeze artist to horseback rider. Anything they asked her to do, she did. Then one year later, she met Paul and both claimed they knew right away they were meant for each other. The couple married in 1943 and bought a home in Tampa, Florida. Together, they toured the country for 12 years with Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus. Eight months out of the year, they called a stateroom on the train home. But during the other four, they spent it together in Florida. The couple did not have children, so all of their off time was spent honing Paul's craft. Described as an engineer and gimmick builder, Paul developed a laugh factory back home. On the outside, it seemed like any ordinary garage, but inside was the catalog of classic clowning gags. Paul rented out his iconic props and costumes to many other circuses and ice show performances. He also spent these extra months creating new and inventive routines for himself and colleagues to entertain thousands of bystanders. Paul was dedicated to his craft and he never missed a show. When he developed a hip injury, he incorporated this into his act by training a duck to waddle after him with a similar gait around the arena. Even when Elsie took her final bow with the circus, Paul continued to travel throughout the year while Elsie ran the Laugh Factory. When asked why he chose to clown for so long, he claimed the reason we all stay on with the circus, I guess, is that there's no thrill on earth like that first big roaring laugh from the audience on opening night, if your act is good. He contributed his success to a simple formula. The act had to be topical and simple, but most importantly, the clown always had to get the worst end of it. His success in the circus pushed beyond the big top when he was offered roles in films such as The Greatest Show on Earth in 1952 
and Pinocchio in 1957. He was selected by Kellogg to be the face of Sugar Smack Cereal for several years. Paul Jung quickly became one of the world's most recognizable clowns. Alongside movies and products, he was featured in many commercial advertisements, with his face being used as a generic clown on European circus posters. Paul was highly regarded by his fellow performers and well-loved, but he liked to stay discreet about his personal life away from the circus. He often preferred to be alone, enjoying his movies, and an evening inside rather than going out with friends. Paul was friendly and very kind to those who knew him, which made his untimely death hard on those who were close. On April 21, 1965, in Madison Square Garden in New York, Merling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey held an early Easter performance to a standing room only crowd of 18,000 plus patrons. The show was scheduled to go on at 10.30 a.m. and as the performers started to gather a bit before 10 a.m., several colleagues noticed Paul wasn't present. Two performers closest to him, Prince Paul and Harry Nelson, noticed first. The two worked alongside Paul since the 1930s and knew he never missed a show. They couldn't understand why he wasn't there and started the hunt for him. Both men knew where Paul was staying. Just as he did the eight previous seasons, Paul rented a room at the Forest Hotel, which was just a block from Madison Square Garden. Prince Paul phoned the front desk and asked for Paul Jung. The call was sent to room 1211, but there was no answer. He returned to Harry with the update and the two were even more concerned about their friend. Paul was punctual, and it had to be something really bad for him to not make it to the stage. Harry tried to call as well. He rang the room twice and received no answer. They got in touch with the hotel manager, who also tried to ring Paul's room. When he got no answer, he sent a bellboy over to the room to check on Paul. The bellboy attempted to knock on the door with no answer, so he entered the room. Paul was on the floor face up, stretched across the narrow entryway into the bedroom. He was covered with a blood-stained bed sheet. Paul's head was badly beaten and his body was covered in severe bruises. The room itself was blood spattered with the unmade bed pushed away from the wall. Paul was found in his brown striped pajama bottoms and an undershirt. His hands were bound behind him with a cloth. Dean McMurray, the assistant director of the circus, was asked to identify Paul's body and provide all details he could about him. Police arrived at the scene where Detective Leo Murphy headed the investigation. Initially, motive was difficult to establish. The room showed no signs of forced entry, indicating Paul willingly let his murderer into the room. They didn't believe robbery to be the motive. During the search of the room, they discovered a watch, his wedding ring, and about $226 inside of his pants pocket. Alongside the valuables, they discovered eight full beer cans near Paul's body, which was odd since Paul was not a drinker. Nearby stores were checked for clues about who might have purchased this beer, but this lead was a dead end. As they dusted for fingerprints and clues, they told the press it was far too early to determine what exactly happened. It was reported the murder weapon was not found, but police chose to leave this information out of the public. It was revealed the blunt object used on Paul was a two foot long, eight pound brass nozzle that was removed from the fire hose in the hotel hallway. Another key piece of information police omitted was the binding used on Paul. It wasn't just a piece of cloth, but a woman's stocking. His autopsy was performed where cause of death was due to several skull fractures, which caused brain damage. They placed his time of death between 11.30 p.m. and 1 a.m. When Elsie was informed of her husband's death, she couldn't think of a reason anyone would want to hurt Paul. She sobbed to investigators that it was that terrible city, claiming New York was like a jungle. 30 detectives were assigned to this case, they questioned 264 performers within the circus and 233 guests at the Forest Hotel. But it was determined no one within the circus would want to hurt Paul. Not only was everyone accounted for the night prior, they stated Paul was never known to have an enemy. He was the guy everybody liked. Paul was a sweetheart who could make anybody's problems seem very light. They claimed the only thing he took seriously was his work. He was gentle and popular amongst coworkers. 
and he had little contacts outside of the circus because of his shy nature. They learned the previous evening, Paul rejected dinner plans with co-workers and instead returned to his hotel room because he was expecting a long-distance call. He was last seen by the hotel staff around 7.30 p.m. Investigators also determined no calls were made in or out of his room that night. Although the circus lead seemed fruitless, they learned from his closest friends that Paul always traveled with a portable typewriter. Paul always had this typewriter so he could send letters to his friends and fans. The problem with this, though, was they didn't recall seeing a typewriter in his room. The news of the missing typewriter was also withheld from public information as the lead was explored. For weeks, investigators traced the typewriter. They searched pawn shops all over the city, hoping their murderer slipped up. Eventually, this effort would pay off when Paul's typewriter turned up at an uptown Manhattan pawn shop. The pawnbroker provided the ticket, which unfortunately contained fraudulent information about the seller. The name and address provided led them to no one, but the pawnbroker was able to describe the man who sold it to him. They quizzed the other brokers who were able to lead investigators to this man. When he was found, he identified himself as a fence, someone who buys and sells stolen goods. The typewriter he received came from another man, and he wasn't sure how the typewriter came to his possession. The fence pointed investigators towards Alan Jones. Alan Jones was a 24-year-old laborer from Harlem. Police staked out his apartment and other known hangout spots. On June 5, 1965, Alan was finally located and arrested. The woman he lived with, 21-year-old Marion DeBerry, who was known by law enforcement for prostitution, was also arrested. Both suspects were questioned by the Manhattan Assistant District Attorney and other officials of the police department. Both Allen and Marion acknowledged they both were addicted to drugs and had a $40 a day habit. Initially, neither of them wanted to talk about Paul, but in exchange for a guilty plea to a lesser charge of third degree assault, Marion decided to talk. Per her recollection, Paul arranged for a date with her and she and Jones were in need of money due to their addiction. Paul seemed like an easy mark. So when she went to his room, she propped the door open so Alan could enter behind her, and the duo could rob Paul. When Paul refused to comply, Alan knocked him unconscious with a fire hose nozzle, then tied him up with her stocking and beat him to death. Identification of both the murder weapon and binding used confirmed the pair were involved in the murder, since these details were purposely withheld from public information. Marion stated they stole $40 from his wallet and his typewriter before fleeing. Based upon her confession, Marion and Allen were arrested the following morning on June 6th. Allen's confession followed shortly after. Allen's arraignment was scheduled for June 30th, where he entered a plea of not guilty to first degree murder. During the arraignment, Allen claimed his constitutional rights were violated by police, who allegedly used force to obtain their statements. His attorney asked all statements made be thrown out, since they were false and made under fear. However, this was rejected by the court, and both Allen and Marion were held without bond. Allen's trial started in September of 1967, with Marion testifying on behalf of the state. Marion took the stand and explained she was looking for business and was invited to the room by Paul, who gave her $20 and two circus tickets. She confessed again she propped the door open and allowed Alan to come into the room where he was armed with a fire hose nozzle. She stated he murdered Paul when he wouldn't listen to their demands. Alan hit him in the head five or six times, and when he was finished, he wiped the blood off of the nozzle with a towel, then gagged Paul and bound him. They searched his pockets before leaving. She noted Paul was still breathing, a fact that matched the testimony provided by the chief medical examiner pertaining to Paul's time of death. Marion stated she let Alan in because she was afraid of him. After five weeks of trial and four and a half hours of deliberation, the jury found Alan Jones guilty of murder on October 17, 1967. On November 20th, he was sentenced to life in prison at the Fulton Correctional Facility. On October 23, 1967, Marion appeared in court for her assault charge, 
where she was sentenced to time served. Marion spent the last two years in the women's house of detention from the time of her arrest. Upon her release, Marion disappeared from the public eye. Paul Jung's remains were cremated and no public funeral was held. Elsie kept the Laugh Factory going well into the 70s after her husband's murder. A 1965 article headline reported on his death stating it was a tragic end for the good-humored funny man who made a career of making three generations laugh. Despite his popularity, Paul's death was one of the only times his name made headlines, despite his face being familiar around the world. Paul was and is remembered fondly by circus performers and enthusiasts alike. His image inspired many artists even long after his death. In 1992, Paul Jung was inducted into the International Clown Hall of Fame in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Hi friends, if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. So for some reason, I find myself obsessed with circus history. So I wanted to put this out there that if you know any more cases that fit into our niche here, let me know. I'd be interested in reading about them. But as always, I want to hear your thoughts. So leave them below and we can chat about this case. If you found this to be informative, please consider giving the video a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more from me. And lastly, if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. I appreciate your support and kindness always, and I hope you all have the best week ahead of you because you deserve it. But for now, we must part ways. So stay safe out there, and I will see you in the next one. Bye, friends.